Welcome to Joy for the Journey, a worship service television ministry presented by your friends at the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. to do my duty to God in my country, and to obey the scout law and to help other people at all times to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Spirit, the Lord be with you this morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, if there's anyone new that's out there, my name is Michael Agapito. I'm the associate pastor here at First Baptist, and uh, we're just really glad to be with you here worshiping the Lord this morning. Um, if you'd like to connect with the church for whatever reason, uh, please feel free to fill out the connect card, which you can find in the pew rack in front of you. And if you are new to First Baptist, uh, go ahead and um, fill it out. Uh, and take it to the Welcome Center just outside at the gathering place at the desk, and we'll have a gift for you waiting there. And whether you're new or you're a longtime member, um, if you want to contact or connect with the church, please feel free to uh, fill it out. Um, if you could also please sign the Friendship Registers. Those are the Burgundy books uh, also located on the inside of your pew racks or at the end of your pews, and then pass them down your pews to register your attendance with us today. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Our prayer focus for today is for the uh, Boy Scouts of America. Known members and friends hospitalized include Gary Kinnearum, uh, who was recently hospitalized, uh, and we'd like to share our cr Christian sympathies um, and extend them to uh, Shirley Williver um, and family at the death of her husband, David. So uh, let's be lifting them up in prayer um, and uh, just be praying for their family. Joy Givers, our, which is our senior adult ministry, will meet um, at noon this Tuesday. Uh, please check your bulletin for that for more details. The YMCA Family Fun Night that we have every year will be on Sunday, February 19th. Uh, read more about this fun-filled evening in your bulletin. And then finally, next Sunday, the Willing Hands Kids Club will try to tackle hunger with the Super Bowl uh, Super Bowl of Caring Offering, emphasis on the soup, S-O-U-P, Super Bowl of Caring Offering. Uh, please bring one dollar or more um, for their soup pots, if you would like some. Please read your bulletin for more information on these and other things happening at First Baptist Church. Now we have you'll all stand with me for the call to worship and the invocation as we prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship uh, comes to you today from uh, Romans 15, uh, verse 4, from the NIV translation. Let's read the word of God together. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, 
and in our actions by what we have done or failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as yourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us so that we can delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Lord, we pray that you be with all those that are sick or healing. We pray that you be with Gary and that your healing hand will be upon him. And we pray for the Wolvers, Lord, that you um, wrap them with your love and surround them with your love during this time. And finally, God, set us free from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of the abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. These are man's hands. Or, no. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> He wouldn't dare have you sit as I'm walking up to the podium, surely. If you would all please join me in singing wonderful words of life, and they are wonderful. <laughs>
Good morning, First Baptist. If you would please stand if you are able and uh, join us in singing these, uh, these words of truth.
Lord, we just ask that you will wrap your loving arms around us, that you will guide us and direct us this week. Lord, we're thankful for everyone here today. Um, Lord, we know that there are people here that are hurting. We know that there are people here who are filled with joy, but still hurting. And Lord, we just know that they are all surrounded, surrounded by love. Lord, I just pray that these these people that are here today will just feel our love, your love through us. We just thank you, Lord, for all you've done, all that you do, and how great you are. Amen. say to, uh, to Lucas and Caleb, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for leading us in the pledge. Uh, we're glad to have you here on uh, uh, Scout Sunday. And uh, I want to say thank you to the choir also for that beautiful song that you sang, uh, The Welcome Table. I love how God puts things together sometimes, uh, how he just kind of shows up. And uh, I feel like he showed up this morning because I didn't know what the choir was singing, and you had no idea uh, what I had in mind to share before we shared it in the Lord's Supper uh, this morning. But um, what, I, what I want us to think about as we consider the Lord's Supper uh, this morning is, um, you know, we have a phrase in our language, uh, when all else fails, read the directions, Right? Uh, in other words, uh, when, we, when we can't kind of figure it out, we need to uh, uh, consult uh, the manual. Uh, God has given us a manual. He has given us uh, his word to, uh, to give us direction. 
And um, the very practice that we're going to do this morning in our remembering and celebrating the Lord's Supper is also kind of, of a reminder. It's, it's kind of ironic. We live in the day and age where, with GPS where you just type in a destination and it tells you how to get there and when you're going to get there. Uh, but we, uh, we know that we ultimately, through Jesus, have a destination as well. Let me read to you the words from the Apostle Paul regarding uh, observing the Lord's Supper. He said, For what I received from the Lord I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And he, uh, once he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Take now in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. This morning, I was thinking about how um, really all, all of history, um, biblically speaking, revolves around two things. Jesus' first coming, his first advent, in which he died and rose again uh, so that we might have life everlasting, and his second coming, when human history will come to an end and eternity will start. And we're living in between those two. Now, the Bible is our direction book, but communion is kind of a constant reminder that we're on that road and that he's coming back one day. And I really appreciated the words that the choir kept singing, one of these days, one of these days, because when we uh, take seriously what Jesus did for us, we can live in the reality of that hope every day, that one of these days we'll be with him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we bow before you, and first and foremost, we want to thank you that you're merciful and gracious and kind. And we are grateful that you made a way for us. You made it possible for us to be made right with you and to be able to be with you forever. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you willingly came and gave of your life on the cross of Calvary and rose victorious from the dead so that we, by faith, can have life everlasting through you. We pray you would bless these elements that represent your very body and blood, and may we take them in a worthy manner, acknowledging you as King and Lord and Savior. We pray in your name. Amen. If you would take the, the bread, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you and me, take now in remembrance of him. And the blood of Christ, poured out for the forgiveness of our sins, take in remembrance of him. Amen. God bless you. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. We're in week three of our study on spiritual warfare, and we're going to focus this morning on the belt of truth. 
um, that God gives us the equipment that we need to, uh, to deal with this spiritual battle that uh, is ever around us. You know, I know that some people don't even believe that there's a spiritual battle going on, that it's just flesh and blood, that's all there is. The scriptures teach us that there is, uh, there is a cosmic realm in which uh, we're ever dealing with things, and, and I kind of illustrate it this way. And um, uh, kind of bear with me for a moment, because I'm going to go back in time uh, to my previous church, and uh, the director of the, the computer lab at the high school in the town invited me to come to their brand new computer lab at the high school. And um, so I went into this large room in the high school, room full of computers, and he, uh, he brought the computer up. I didn't know anything about computers at that point, or very little. And um, he, he got me so that I could search something. He said, type in anything you want to know something about. I don't even remember what I typed in. Now, um, a lot of you younger people will not understand this, but I typed it in, hit return, and then slowly this screen started coming down. And I, I mean slowly because it was slow. But I was absolutely mesmerized. I was amazed because then there were all these listings of these different things that I had typed in. And he said, just just click on one of those. Well, I had to explain how you click on it and everything like that. But um, so I did. And I could read about this stuff. And then he said, pick another subject. And I, I did. And it was over and over again. And I, I was sitting there. And I see, I see all my young adults smiling. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. But I was sitting there and I was thinking, this is absolutely amazing. It's like all this stuff is out there but you don't see it until you get on this computer. But it's real. It's a real world, isn't it? In fact, we call it the World Wide Web, right? It's, it's, it's out there. In fact, we've advanced so much in using it that now there are people that make a living by influencing you and me to purchase things, right? They're called influencers, and that, that's, that's what they do is make videos and they try to influence. It's a pretty good picture of the spiritual realm that is going on because Satan and his minions are always working to influence us one way or another. And as I told you last week, uh, what's at risk is souls. What's at risk is life, eternal, and um, and God wants us uh, equipped. And so there is this spiritual warfare um, that is uh, the cosmic struggle um, that's currently raging um, until the Lord Jesus returns and rules uh, forever. In fact, in 1 Peter uh, 1.13, it says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope, on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Um, Peter is saying, we need to be ready and we need to be set because um, there's this struggle. And it's interesting because Peter uses the same word that Paul uses um, when he tells us to buckle on the belt of truth. He's, he's saying, set your mind your, your hearts. Um, and Christians being pictured as soldiers in the battle emphasizes the necessity for our obedience. Uh, I've got a knight up here. Now, that's not, a, that's not what a Roman soldier would look like. That's, a, that's an extra from VBS uh, a few years ago. So, uh, but he, he's clad and he's ready, he's ready for a, a battle. Um, I believe the Apostle Paul, probably two reasons why he, he, he chose uh, Roman armor to describe God equipping us for this battle. Number one, he's writing from prison. He, he's imprisoned. He's chained. And most likely, he's chained to a Roman soldier. So every day, he's, he's got this fellow that he can look at 
all of his equipment and be thinking almost like a children's story or an objective lesson. Well, these things correlate with spiritual things that are going on. But also, I think he's emphasizing how vital it is for us to obey the Lord. And um, let me give you an example. If you're in a work environment and you don't agree with your supervisor or maybe you're not agreeing with how the company is going, at a certain point, you can just choose to, I'm going to go find another job, right? I'm, I'm going to pursue something else. If you're in the military and you're involved in a, a combat situation and you don't obey the commanding officer, that's serious. I mean, it's potentially treasonous. Why? Because there are lives at stake. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's this sense of obedience is vital. And Paul is saying that same kind of idea. Um, and so he, he makes it clear that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Therefore, we have to have supernatural gear. In other words, what we're given uh, by God is how we do the battle. It's not ours. God will equip us with it. Uh, and in this case, where we're talking about the belt of truth, uh, it's God's truth that he provides. It's not our truth. I think it was Oprah Winfrey that originally uh, kind of uh, coined this phrase, my truth. Uh, we don't make up truth, people. God is truth, and he has spoken truth and revealed truth, and we need to honor that. Ultimately, putting on this belt uh, is a, a sign of Christian integrity. It's living out the truth as well as knowing it. Uh, James tells us that we're not merely to be hearers of the word, but we're to be doers of the word also. And Satan is just the opposite of that. He's a liar and deceiver, and therefore truth is the first piece of equipment uh, that the Christian needs. I find it a little ironic. Paul gives us seven things that we ultimately need for this battle, and the first thing isn't a weapon at all. It's a, it's a belt, um, but it really holds everything else together. Um, and, and so what we're going to do today is look at the belt of truth and see how you put it on, and we're going to um, look at an example uh, from Jesus' teaching. So the belt of truth is God's word. It's what he has revealed to us, um, and that belt of truth is foundational for the rest of the year. The Roman soldiers, uh, they, uh, they needed that belt because they wore tunics, these loose pieces of cloth. And when they were going to be involved in a hand-to-hand uh, -hand, hand -hand combat, they would tuck those pieces up in their belt so they didn't get tripped up uh, when they were in battle. The belt also held the breastplate up in place. So it was vitally important uh, that they have that. Uh, you kind of have a little bit of an example of that even in Scripture for the Israelites when you read in Exodus how Moses gave the people instructions uh, about the Passover. And when they were to eat the Passover lamb, he gave them some strange instructions because uh, it wasn't just how to prepare the meal and eat the meal. He told them uh, that they were to have their in the King James, their loins girded. In other words, they were to have their robes tucked up in their belt and they needed to be ready to go. In other words, you, you, you got to be set and ready. And that's the picture of the belt is being ready and set. And we can be ready for the battle when we're taking seriously the truth of the word of God. And what does that ultimately mean uh, for you and me? Ultimately, it means that you and I need to take seriously and we need to believe the Bible. Or spiritually, we're going to fall. He tells, us, uh, he tells us three different times, take your stand, be able to stand. And we can't stand if, first of all, we don't trust this book. 
we don't trust what God has revealed to us. Uh, and he, here is the problem. Sometimes, sometimes we can look at God's Word and we can think it's, uh, it's an accumulation of God's suggestions rather than His directives. What do I mean by that? Oh, I like this, but I don't like that. And so that I won't, I won't apply. That I won't adhere to. Uh, I read just this past week about a pastor who had an issue with a, a, a church member who he was preaching through uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and uh, a, a congregant afterwards said that, uh, that loving your enemy and praying for people that persecute you, where'd you get that stuff? And he said, uh, those were Jesus' words thinking, well, the guy would go, oh, he said, well, that doesn't work, so why are you telling people to do that? Who's in authority then? Uh, when we pick and choose, uh, we're uh, placing ourselves in authority over what God ultimately says. God has given us uh, objective truth, and I, I want to kind of demonstrate a little bit the evidence of God's word just by using his word. In 2 Peter 1, uh, 20 and 21, Peter writes, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter saying, nobody, no individual author just wrote these things, but rather God wrote these things through them. The Holy Spirit uh, provided that truth. Um, when I was in college, Melinda and I both, when we were at Judson College, there was requi three required courses that we had to take no matter what degree you were getting. They were humanities classes. I, I did not like the classes. And it wasn't necessarily because of the subject, but every single one of those classes had a group project. Have you ever done group projects? I hated those group projects because inevitably we always had four students and one of those four didn't give a rip about doing the project and really contributed nothing. And uh, you might have one or two that really want to get a decent grade and are putting forth effort, and then you had kind of one in the middle. And all three times, all three of those classes, every single time, turn in the paper, significant amount of your grade, and get the paper back, and there was always this comment. This paper wasn't very unified. Duh. Four different people involved. Four different ways of looking at things. Four different writing styles. It, it was really, I found it very, very frustrating. Here's a book. 66 books in the Bible. Written by 40 different people. Over a period of 150 years. In three different languages. Written in three different continents, and yet you find unity in the message from the beginning to the end. Why? Because it's not just a human book. It's authored by the Holy Spirit who led those individuals to record these things and give a picture. It is objective truth. And Peter said, um, these prophecies that are made, they weren't just made because these guys thought it up. I'll give you one example. Micah wrote that the Messiah would be born in a little town called Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem. You know where uh, Joseph and Mary were living? Nazareth, about 100 miles away. They had no good reason to go 
to Bethlehem. Except that Caesar said, there's going to be taxes, and we're going to have a census, and everybody has to go to their family of origins, city or town. And Joseph was from the line of David, and so he had to go. And so Jesus, what we celebrate his coming at Christmas time, he had physically nothing to do with where he was born. But God orchestrated it and fulfilled his truth, his promise, his prophecy. Because he is true. And that's just one of hundreds of examples in the Bible of fulfillment. God has given his objective truth for us uh, so that we can uh, believe and trust in him. And as we trust his word, then we can have subjective truth as well because then we're equipped to live that truth out. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, all scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped uh, for every good work. God has given us the Bible, his word, so that we can receive what we need so that we're actually equipped to do his work. And, and this teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training, you don't get it if you go, well, I like this, but I don't like this. There is no relationship that works that way. When we, when we pick and choose, we make God into our image. We make God like us. In real relationships, husbands and wives, don't we uh, interact and sometimes uh, we uh, teach, rebuke, correct, and train? Don't we do the same with our children? Don't we, because when you love somebody, there's always a ways in which we can help each other? Are you with me? And yet, we can be guilty of making God so. Well, no. Surely God agrees with me on everything. Because I'm right, right? No. Uh, we, we, we need his uh, correction. Jesus, uh, in his uh, teaching of the parables about the kingdom... Uh, he refers to the sower and the seed. And the seed is the word of God. He, he's saying every, every heart is a representation of soil that either or receives the truth and then grows and flourishes or is hard or is weedy and rejects the truth. But the seed is consistent. It's God's truth, his word. And in the book of Acts, the account of the early church in which uh, the church is growing and thriving and sharing the gospel, evangelism itself uh, is described like this. When you have oh, so many new believers are added to the church, it's referred to as the word of God was spread or the word of God was received by people. Why? Because God's truth is foundational to anybody coming to faith and knowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have it without uh, believing what God has said and practicing that. And, the, and so it's vital for us to know uh, the Word of God and then also to apply it, uh, to, to live it out and to live under His authority. So how do you and I put on the belt of truth? We put it on by believing the Bible by trusting what God has said. And Jesus is a perfect example. Uh, the, uh, the first time Jesus is tempted when he's in the wilderness after he has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan comes and tempts him, turn this stone into bread. What does Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He's saying, this, this is our purpose, to live within the truth of what God has revealed to, to us. 
And Jesus is the perfect example of the man who lived a perfect life uh, doing everything that God the Father prompted him uh, to do. In 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul tells the believers, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Paul's saying, if you're not taking God's word, you're, you're not rejecting me. Uh, you're rejecting God. And if, if you choose to do that, it, it comes with consequences. Likewise, the psalmist, uh, encouraging uh, himself and believers, he says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I, I take your word. And um, that's more than memorizing it. That's saying, I'm going to live it out. And as, as I live it out, um, I, I, I know then I won't go astray because God's never going to mislead you or me. He's never going to misguide us. So I'm just going to take one example from Jesus' teaching and we'll apply it. Um, really, what I'm going to show you is something that you can do with any particular thing that you might be struggling with. But uh, I'm, I'm going to, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he addressed worry. I won't ask anybody to raise their hands if you ever struggle with worry sometimes. But Jesus, uh, Jesus does a little thing that demonstrates how we can put on that belt of truth, how we can apply God's word. Um, follow along with me as I read from uh, Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about, what your, about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Uh, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you, uh, that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so here Jesus, addressing anxiety, addressing worry, he, uh, he says, consider the lilies of the field. What, what he's saying is, Jesus is inviting the hearers to think biblically. He, he, he's inviting people to go, okay, let's think about it for a little while. Um, God adorns these flowers that are here and gone, uh, adorns them much better than King Solomon, who at that point had been the richest of all the kings. Uh, he, he, uh, he takes care of the birds. They don't fret or worry uh, where their next meal is coming. Uh, Jesus is saying, consider what the Bible tells us about who God is. And in light of who God is, do you and I need to be anxious? If God cares for the flowers and the birds, will he not care for you and me? That's what Jesus is saying, right? He says, he's, he's saying, take the truth and apply it. And he says, therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Worry may not be your thing. Something else might be something that you're struggling with right now. Look for his answers. Apply his truth. Trust him. Believe him. Follow after him. 
if we're to stand, uh, we must fill our minds with the truth of God's word and live in obedience to the scripture's teaching. First and foremost, that's the belt of truth. First thing we need. Let's pray together. Father God, first and foremost, we want to thank you that you have revealed yourself through your word, the Bible, and through your word, your son, Jesus. And Father, we acknowledge that there is an enemy of our soul, Satan, who is a liar, and he's a master craftsman at lying. And he loves to deceive people who are made in your image and who are made to have a relationship with you, who are made to have a purpose and meaning and hope in you. But just like when he tempted Adam and Eve and he said, surely God did not say this, he feeds that same kind of thinking into minds and hearts today. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to put on the belt of truth, to trust your revealed word, to entrust ourselves to your son, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and to live out our faith in obedience to you, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of others who watch our lives, for the sake of your kingdom, and ultimately for your glory and your honor. We pray in the marvelous name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is Break Thou the Bread of Life. And as we stand and sing this hymn, uh, the altar is open for any and all, anyone who uh, um, God has been tugging at your heart to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there are counselors that are uh, ready and available to, to pray with you, anyone who wants to rededicate their life, someone who may want to uh, join the church family. Maybe you just have a prayer issue that you want to pray over. Uh, feel free to come as we stand and sing together. Break thou the bread of life.
Thank you for watching Joy for the Journey, a presentation of worship from the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. To learn more about the ministries of our church, learn how you can join us in worship, or to support this television ministry, contact us at 1804 South 9th Street, Mattoon, Illinois, 61938. You can also visit us at our website, www.fbcmattoon.org. First Baptist Church, a family for everyone.